Richard Tice, leader of the Reform Party. We're going to do a bit of politics, a bit of personal in this interview. Thank you for joining me. Great. Thank you for having me. So I've been doing lots of cutting searches and reading various articles. I'm and cranky. one really caught me off guard this morning. Did you ever share a flat with Kate Moss? There was all sorts of rumours. The answer is no. Oh! Happy to clarify that. <laughs> oh. Did you all know Kate Moss? Apparently. Uh, <laughs> Richard, you're starting It was a on... long time ago. Oh, you're going to be keep going cagey. Um, well... <laughs> Oh come on! I've got scared. you. You can you can stall. It was, it was a got... rumor. It was a rumor viciously circulated by all sorts of people having fun. But you have met her. I have met her more than once. But I didn't share a flat with her. <laughs> okay, the intrigue continues. <laughs> um, right. Okay. So let's get on to politics. You were a long-standing member of the Conservative Party. I was. Uh, you, you left in 2012. Yes. Um, and then rejoined. Oh. And then left again. Oh, when did you reach? So you, you left so, in 2012 under David Cameron? Yes, yeah, so and I said I would rejoin when he left. He left whenever it was in 16. And so I rejoined, and then I left again in 19. And you went to... And I joined the Brexit, Brexit party, party as it launched. Yeah. So that was obviously quite a moment. Yes, and now you're a, moment. you're a leader of the Reform Party. Is it fair to say that your party is on the right of politics, that you are on the right? Yes, it, it is. But some of our policies are what I would call common sense policies that, in a sense, um, they span the divide. I think politics is shifting anyway. And the old sort of left and right, people actually just want good common sense policies that work. So, for example, we've got a massive energy crisis and some of our energy and utility policies uh, even Keir Starmer doesn't agree with. I think, for example, we should have public ownership of 50% of some of our monopoly utility companies, 50% owned by British pension funds. Starmer doesn't agree with that, so arguably that's to the left of him. So look, it's a range. Our policies are what I think works for the country. Forget ideology, it's what's right for the British people, ordinary families up and down the country. But if we just take your political history and we accept that it has always been on the right. The difficulty that you as a party face is that you said you're going to stand candidates at the next election. Everywhere. Um, everywhere. You, the danger at least, is that you will make the election of a Labour government on the left more likely. No, there's a couple of things here, which is that firstly, vote for what you believe in, not what you're afraid of. Secondly, and crucially, and you're the first person I've said this to, but the simple fact is, in 2019, we stood down, we allowed the Conservative Party to get a thumping majority in order to run the country properly, to get Brexit done, to do it properly. And what have they done? They've ruined the economy, they haven't done Brexit properly, our public services are in a state. Frankly, they've had their chance. They've blown it, they've messed up, they've made lives worse for everybody. We stood down for them now. The right thing now for the country, not for them as a party, the right thing for a country is for them to stand down, stand aside, let me stand against Keir Starmer, and I will beat him hands down. They've had the chance. They've blown it. They've had 12 years, and the country's in the worst state ever. Someone told me yesterday, it's worse than in the late 70s. So the old thing of, um, if, you, if you stand against them, you'll split the vote, mm. you'll let Labour in. And that'll be worse. Nothing could be worse than what this Conservative Party has done to our country in recent years. So they've blown it. They should stand aside. Let me take on Keir Starmer and I win hands down. With the benefit of hindsight then, standing, uh, standing aside, as you did in 2019, uh, in 317 seats, you did the same in the Batley and uh, Spen by-election. You did that to promote the Conservatives, to help, to give the Conservatives Actually, a helping hand. Um, was we, that a mistake? We, we, in 2019, look, the alternative was, was Jeremy Corbyn, which was a horror show. And through gritted teeth, we had to make sure that Brexit was done. They've done it really badly, they've betrayed it. But uh, the reason for Batley and Spen was actually, we knew that by-election would be a horror show. It was, yeah. we wanted nothing to do with it. It right. wasn't to help the Conservatives. Right. Okay. I just knew it would be an absolute horror show, and I was right. 
Have you said where you're going to be standing? Where yes, you... I have. I'm standing at Hartlepool. I've already started canvassing there, campaigning there. We've just delivered our first leaflet everywhere. Look, Hartlepool is going to be a two-horse race between the Labour Party and myself, and we're going for it uh, hard, and uh, I'm very confident that I can win it. And that's actually taking a Labour seat. So you're still in the market for... But, in fact, but when it's a I Conservative saw, seat, remember, yes, it, because, it is because, because of the, Jill Mortimer yes, won it back yes, in May 21. Yeah, but it's, a, it's one of those red wall yes. hatland seats that Labour would need to, to, to read. Absolutely. To read I mean, because that really was as heartland as it gets yeah. for the Labour Party. Yeah. So you're standing in, in Hartlepool. And I saw a list of some of the seats that you were standing yes. in. I'll, that's right. Or, or your priorities, not standing, because you're standing, standing in all the seats. Except but, the Northern Ireland. but the priority seats, yes, I think, like, Barnsley was, East was the top, right. or something, Mansfield was in there, uh, I think, from memory, Bolso was at you. Yes, yes, that's right. All sort of Labour companies. Industrial and, heartlands, right. strong Brexit seats, you know, great parts of this country have been, been let down by both main parties. You know, Labour let down those constituencies for decades, right? And, uh, and the Tories came in, they promised to level up, and they've done nothing. Absolutely nothing. And these are, these are constituencies that actually benefited from the energy treasure we have under our feet. Mm. The coal, the gas, the oil. They understand what makes Britain tick and makes Britain competitive in the manufacturing industry. They've all been let down. How many general election candidates have been selected, roughly? I don't expect you to... So, uh, as we speak, I've got about 600, of which we've allocated, give or take, just under a half. So we're well on the way. Now look, we're two years ahead, and obviously for personal reasons, some people will come and go, yeah. but we're well on the way. We're, we're being inundated with applicants to be candidates. Obviously you have to go through the whole vetting process right. and all that good stuff. Yeah. And, uh, and then we've had an absolute surge of members join us. In recent weeks, we've had over 7,500, literally since Liz Truss left, left office. When you think about the candidates you're going to stand, do you, do you care, is a consideration, uh, the gender, the ethnicity, any of those considerations that actually, you know, sort of mainstream par politics and parliament think is a, should be a consideration for what our Look, politics is? you take it all like. into account, but the reality is the most important thing is that a candidate's got a, a connection with the constituency, where they're born there, they live there, they work there, okay. uh, whatever. Those are the really key things so that they understand the constituency. And look, it's a bit of a juggling act, obviously, but we're working very hard on it. And by doing it early, we're well on the case, and hopefully the jigsaw will sort of work out. You know, there's always a few last-minute bits in the jigsaw that you're trying to fit in, but that's how it works. And the vetting process. So that is to look out for things you, like... You, you've just got to do the stuff. And every party, you yeah. always end up yeah. with one or two horror shows. It, yeah. it just happens. Yeah. But we're doing the best we can. You know, it's social media, it's stuff they've written. Yeah. You know, if they've said daft stuff, horrific stuff, written yeah. bad stuff, and you have to look back a long way. Okay. That's, so that's, that's, nice. that's just... And there's a, there's a cost and a process to it, but it's important to do it. So you, you spent most of your li life in business. You're now in frontline politics. You are the leader of a, a, a political party, um, standing seats and standing candidates in every seat at the next election. What level of abuse have you had since becoming a frontline politician? <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, <clears throat> look, in the, uh, in the European elections, it was extraordinary. We were holding rallies and there were placards, Nazis, racists. I thought, wow. Uh, so, um, pretty grim, actually. And, but you just, yeah, you've been a politician, you understand it. Uh, you just develop a, a certain sort of leatherness to the skin and, and let it bounce off and try not to look at social media and all this stuff. I can deal with it, actually. The worst bit really is for the family, the children and the extended family who, who may be fortunate or less fortunate to share the same surname. And then they sort of join the dots and... How old are your kids? My kids, they're all uh, now in their early 20s. Give or take, they're almost all off the payroll. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, um, but they're doing great, yeah. Are you, do you still have your mum and dad? Sadly not, no. Um, both passed away in recent years. Mum passed away actually in the middle of the European election campaign in 19. Which, as you can imagine, I mean, that campaign was, was insane. We were everywhere, and so it was a really difficult time because Mum passed away, and then we had the funeral during the middle of the campaign, and it was a, 
it was a moment really I couldn't, I couldn't stop. And so my brother and sister did a brilliant job dealing with everything that had to be dealt with. But for me, it was a, I was just full steam ahead. So it was a difficult time. And you went to your mum's funeral? Yes, I did. Yes, but uh, it I've... was a sort of, no, it's, it's always a horror show. Uh, absolute horrendous time. And doing that in the middle of a full-blown campaign, that was the only day I took off in the campaign. And I can see, and I don't want to make you upset, but I can see that it's... Yeah, it was a, it was a tough gig. Tough gig. Have you grieved? Are you still in grief for your, um, your mum? It's a really good question and ish, I would say, is the answer. Ish. It comes and it goes. Ah, uh, thank you, thank you. Yes. It's not easy. I asked my dad in the summer. It's, it's not easy no, to go no, through yeah. these things. Um, let's end on something lighter then. That we've had quite a few prime ministers. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to have a drink. Boris Johnson, Liz Truss, or Rishi Sunak. Who are you gonna? Who, who are you gonna invite to your party? Who am I gonna invite to the party? <laughs> um, great question. Actually. <laughs> It's a really good question. It's a hard answer. The answer is probably on, uh, invite all three, but I'm not sure any of them would come, to be honest. <laughs> let alone drink anything, let alone talk to me. Uh, I'm probably not, um, not top of their uh, Christmas card list, it's fair to say. Is there any Labour MP that you'd invite round? <laughs> Excellent, Labour MPs like your good self, of course. Um, uh, no, actually, I think there are some... Uh, there, is, there are some... Really well-meaning people from all the parties, actually. I think most people go into politics wanting to try and do some good. Uh, and look, we, we disagree on policies. The most important thing is that we can be agreeable about how we disagree. And I think the sadness is, in too many instances now, that actually isn't the case. And, uh, you know, when, when I do media and stuff, I do a talk show, uh, it's... It's finding it hard now to get MPs from other parties to even come on the show and talk. And, and I think that's a shame. Have you ever been scared, by the way? We talked about abuse and sort of um, in, in your role in politics, <laughs> not like watching a horror movie. Um, you talked about the abuse, you talked about the placards that you saw. Have you ever f felt uh, intimidated? Yeah, it's a good question. Not yet. Right. Mercifully, let's hope it never happens. There was the slightly strange case of a cyclist who came cycling past me as I was walking down the street a couple of years ago in London, actually talking to a homeless chap, and the cyclist shouted, stab him, stab him, stab him, saying that a homeless gentleman should stab me. I was, what's the point of all this? I mean, you know, we've, we've just got a view and it's, it's politics. We're all trying to say, well, we think the country should be run better this way or that way. I guess he Awful. didn't agree with Brexit. <laughs> and uh, finally, finally. So, how well do you know Kate Moss? <laughs> <laughs> no. I don't. <laughs> OK, Richard Tice. Um, I really enjoyed the chat. I really enjoyed the chat. Thank you. For um, and, um, you know, good luck with, with moving on from life after losing your mum. It's something that happens yeah. to a lot of people. It shows that... We're all human beings and we all go through this, whatever our Absolutely. politics or our Absolutely. positions. But uh, thank you very much. It's been great to be with you. Thank you.